Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Emotional Intelligence um, in Your Job Search, uh, which is part of our Get That Job webinar series. My name is Jordan Neal, and I am the career librarian here at the Champaign Public Library, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to mention some library information that we will e reiterate at the end of the webinar, as well as some webinar details. So as you may uh, know or have heard, the library has um, been open to the public since June with some modifications to the services we offer. I invite you to visit our website, champagne.org, for more information. Um, we are now available to answer your questions in person and virtually. However, you can chat with us um, through our website. Um, you can visit us or email us at librarian at champagne.org. Um, we are still offering our book librarian service virtually if you need any help at home. To request a session, visit champagne.org slash book a librarian to fill out a request form. Um, we're also still offering our curbside service if you wanted to pick up any uh, library items or, um, or you can now come into the library, whichever you would prefer. Uh, just visit champagne.org slash curbside for more information. And as always, um, our e-library is always open where you can enjoy ebooks, movies, and more using your Champagne Public Library card, or you can sign up for a virtual library card through our website for instant access. Finally, I would like to briefly go over a few features available to you that might help during this particular webinar. Um, depending on your computer or device, if you take a look at your Zoom window, you can hopefully see audio settings at the bottom left of the screen. Uh, you can enjoy, uh, adjust your audio settings like changing your speaker by clicking or tapping on the upward arrow next to your speaker. Uh, moving to the center bottom of your screen, you will see a chat and raise hand option. Clicking on the chat will open or close a chat box on the right side of your Zoom window, or sometimes it displays um, in the middle of your screen, and you can drag it around, again, depending on your computer or device. Um, we invite you to use the chat to ask questions or leave comments for us and our presenter. Um, she will try her best to answer them throughout the presentation. Um, you also have the option to raise hand to receive assistance. Um, you can use this if you have any technical difficulties or would like to speak and ask a question um, so we can unmute you if you prefer not to type in the chat. Uh, so without further delay, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Janice All. I invite you to read Janice's entire biography within our event description, but um, long story short, she is bringing us some great insight and experience, and we are so happy she's joined us today. So with that, Janice, I will turn it over to you. Hello, thank you. Hello everyone, Janice All, and it's great to be here. And to get us started, we are going to do a chat. So if you click and look at your toolbar, you'll see the chat function. And what I'd like you to do is in the chat box, select all participants and attendees, and type in one or two sentences of what have you learned about yourself during this pandemic? So in March, when we've had us really change the way we work, that we live, what have you learned about yourself during this pandemic? And there is a question about the recording. Uh, we can send you the recording. And I, we also have a handout that Jordan will send to you after the session to give you the handout. But in the chat box, what have you learned about yourself during this pandemic? What uh, jumped out? So for instance, for me, I really enjoy working from home. Uh, this uh, working virtually and doing webinars such as this online has, has been a plus. I like it. And uh, I'm not sure I want to go back to doing it in person. What else have you learned? Others. I'd like to hear from at least two or three people. What have you learned about yourself during this pandemic? So to find the chat box, go to the toolbar. You should have like three little icons, with three little buttons that says more. Click on more. And then you can hit chat and then make sure it says to all panelists and attendees and type and hit send. Excellent. Thank you for starting this, Gabrielle. So yeah, the, the uh, uh, being at work, so you like that structure of being at, um, in person at work, yes. Uh, changing behaviors, that's with those social restrictions and yeah, how many times we go to leave our car and go, wait, I forgot my mask. So we have to go back and get the mask. Um, Ah, so it's like you're learning more about yourself and how you look at things and that from the optimistic standpoint. Uh, ah, so someone realized they were doing a lot more lip reading and now with the masks we can't uh, because yeah, it's hard. And, and, and seeing facial expressions is so different. Yes, so a lot to learn. 
And this is what this is all about. So what today is all about is, is let's take time, really step back and reflect and say, you know, who am I um, in today's environment? How am I showing up? What, what am I doing that, that shows that I'm at my best? And what do I need to do differently? Especially when I'm trying to find a job, get a promotion or influence people to, to hire me in, into a different position. So we're gonna talk about emotional intelligence, what it is, why it's important for us, especially in the workplace. How can I leverage it and how can I develop it? And what tools and resources are available? In the chat box, feel free to share any additional things you want to get out of tonight. So why else did you join this webinar? Um, so put, send it in the chat. You could just send it to me personally or go ahead and send it to the whole group. But what else do you want to get out of the next uh, 55 minutes that we spend together? Uh, Yes, yeah, Zoom and uh, yeah, that connection, that video connection. We'll talk about the importance of the video connection as well. I'm a big fan of, ch of chat, as you can see. So I keep my eye on chat. So you'll see me look away. I look at the chat box. So please send questions through chat, share your thoughts, share your experiences. If there's a book that you know that you that comes to mind or something that you've read that you highly recommend, share it with your peers because this is an opportunity to, to, to start the dialogue and to keep the dialogue going. We're only spending 60 minutes together. So after the session, find someone to talk to and say, hey, you know, I went to this webinar, this is what I learned. What do you think? What are your thoughts? And then take time to read uh, and uh, do some additional research and I'll give you some resources at the end. So here's who I am. Um, I worked 30 years inside of a corporate environment and now I've had the opportunity to step out and start my own consulting business. But for those 30 years, I have focused on the people side of the business. So I really enjoy working with people and I help I love helping leaders, individuals, or teams identify what they could do to take themselves to the next level. And I'm also a faculty member with Lake Forest Graduate School of Management at my profile on LinkedIn. And um, I like this topic for two reasons. A, just emotional intelligence is something that's fascinating, the science of the brain. But also, I've had to go through the job search. I was downsized a, a few times when I worked inside the corporate environment where they say, hey, your job no longer z exists. You have so many a couple of weeks to find another position. Um, and I've had to make those career changes. And, and it takes a lot of resiliency and a lot of self-reflection to, to be able to come back from that. So at any time, ask questions. Uh, happy to share my, some of my experiences, but I also encourage you to share some of your experiences with your, peer, with your peers. And yes, the, um, the older we get, it's, it's difficult uh, to find a job. And yes, ageism is real, but there's, there's ways we could work around that and, try and leverage our age. Uh, so I'll try and share that as much as I, as I possibly can. But what do you see when you see someone that has a fixed mindset? So if, if you see someone that has a fixed mindset, what are they doing? What behaviors are they demonstrating? So if someone has a fixed mindset, what does that look like? What are they saying? What are they doing? So in the chat box, send it to all participants. So what does a fixed mindset look like? What do you think? Throw it out there in the chat box to everybody. If someone's in a fixed mindset. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Stephanie. So they're um, not open to, ch to growth. Uh, they might not listen really deeply to really internalize what's being said. Um, I want to build off uh, Caroline's uh, remark. Maybe they're not being, they're not willing to change, right? I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying that's, that's someone who is set in their ways might fe feel that way. Hey, I've been doing this job for 30 years. We've always done it that way, right? Have you ever worked with those folks? We've always done it this way. Yeah, they're not flexible. They're not uh, being willing to look at other people's thoughts or other people's ideas and to consider themselves. And they, they're only looking at themselves. Yes, and, and they might avoid those challenges because it's like, no, we've always done it this way. This is what I do. And, you know, I don't want to change. Why do we have to change? So they're resistant to change. So what do you see when someone's in a growth mindset? What does it look like when someone's in a growth mindset? When someone's in a, in a, in a growth mindset. So yes, yeah, so, uh, Raphael, with that, people are resistant to the, adapting to a new environment. Yeah, with that fixed mindset, when COVID hit, they were like, what do you mean I can't go to the office, right? Uh, the growth mindset, they're going to be open to feedback. They're going to want to learn. Uh, they're going to be resilient, open to new ideas, ad adapting to new ways. So when we had his, uh, you know, COVID hit, we had to change our behaviors. They were very quick to find those workarounds and new ways of doing things. They, they might have even come up with some novel ideas of let's do this. It's like, hey, what a brilliant idea. They might have been the ones making the masks and giving them out to their friends. Yep, so they're, they're willing to find new ways, uh, find new ways of doing things exactly. And that's what the growth mindset is. It's, it's 
be, it's what, everything that you listed, it's being willing to change, it's being willing to look at things from a different perspective and say, wait, how can I take this challenge and turn it into an opportunity? Um, what are some things I could influence and control? What are some things that I could actually try and change? That fixed mindset is, as someone mentioned, that people are just stuck in their own little head and they're not willing to look outside to see what are the possibilities? What might I do differently? Um, you know, even though I've been doing this job for 15 years or I've been out of the market for 15 years, how could I fit in? Growth mindset's gonna go in there going that curious and let's explore where a fix might be. It's never gonna work. It's not, I'm, it's, I'm never gonna be able to get anywhere. So my, I encourage you to really, you know, let's think about where are you coming from with your growth mindset? Do you have that resiliency? So when you get, get that challenge and you've had that interview and, and then, you know, they say, no, we're look at someone else. And, um, you know, how, are you able to recover from that? And then how uh, do you have that perseverance of just keep, keep working through, finding an opportunity, networking, you know, talking to different people, to, building a different skill. Are, are you working through that? And then do you have that agility to change? It might be I have to change careers. Um, you know, job roles change every, used to be job roles changed way back when, every uh, eight, uh, 18 to 36 months. Then it was every uh, 12 to 36 months job roles changed. And now I'm thinking job roles probably change every six to 12 months, right? Because think about what we were doing in March and think what we're doing today, completely different. So do you, are you, do you have the agility to, you're willing to change direction, uh, learn new skill sets and do things differently if and when needed. And so this is what uh, having that growth mindset is all about. Is that recover, how fast you recover, being, just really being steadfast and being nimble. And it's being willing to learn. So it's be, being willing to learn. So it's, it's, you know, do you have that ambition, that motivation? Are you eager to give something a try? Like I've never done this before, so let me let me try it. Uh, do you have that self-awareness? Like, do you really truly know what your strengths are, and do you know what your opportunities are? And uh, Jordan and I were discussing before the before the webinar started. We were talking about video. And I've met people that, that are like, oh, I don't like seeing myself on video. I don't want to use my video. And you know, I don't like the way I look. And, and my comment to that is, that's what we see when we're in the workplace. We're seeing your face. We're seeing your expressions. You know, we're seeing you. You're just finally seeing yourself. And so instead of you looking at it like, oh, I don't like the way I look, is look and say, okay, how am I showing up? What are my facial expressions saying? What's my eye contact saying? Um, what do I normally look like when I'm thinking, right? And then learn from that and then experiment and try. So that's really having that, that self-awareness, which feeds into that supportive self-talk. So do you, are you able to... Um, look at things, and someone mentioned it optimistically, you know, how can I, I can say it again, how can I take this challenge and turn it into an opportunity? Um, and how can I really make sure that I'm tapping into my core strengths and know what those core strengths are? Um, and, and being in that child mindset. Uh, what's the phrase that any child under the age of three uses? Probably under the age of four. What's a phrase any child under the age of four uses all the time in the chat box? Go ahead and send it. We hear this any child under the age of four, they're constantly saying this or asking this. What's that phrase? Send, send a chat. I know there's parents out there. I know you've heard this. Yes, exactly. Why? 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 Exactly. As adults, when we're working with our peers or, or our managers delegating responsibilities, in our head, we're probably thinking why, but we're not asking. And I encourage you to ask why. You know, why are we doing this? How's it going to add value? Um, uh, what skills do I have and what did you appreciate about me? So ask, we keep asking why. So that curious mindset um, and, and try something different. And then are you willing to step out of your comfort zone? Are you willing to say, you know what, I've never done this before, but let me give it a try. And your comfort zone is going to be different. So never, ever, ever compare yourself to anybody else. If any, it's where am I at today? And what do I need to take myself to the next level? And for some people, they're willing to take huge steps out of their comfort zone. For other people, if I just take a baby step, I'm fine with that. And that's okay. The key is, is that continuous learning, continuous growth, and you, and you keep challenging yourself to get out of your comfort zone. Um, and, you, and you admit that, you know what, I don't know this. This is brand new to me. Um, this is a new experience. Can someone help me? Because that takes a lot to admit that, that you don't know or that you made a mistake. So looking at these attributes that are on the screen, which one or which uh, one or two do you think are your strengths? So in the chat box, which one or two would you think are your strengths? Like, you know what, I think I'm pretty good at this. Now send this to all attendees because there's a, a reason why I'm having you do this. So of these that you see in the screen, which ones do you feel are your strengths? 
Excellent. Thank you, Stacy, for starting. Ah, so we have a lot of curiosity, which makes sense, our curiosity, because you're on the call today. So thank you. Yes. Others. Ah, excellent. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. Excellent. Now see who the participants are on the screen. And I believe you have an opportunity where you could, if you put your mouse over their name, you could chat with them and share email addresses and say, hey, let's get together for a virtual cup of coffee and talk about what we learned. Um, I want to develop my curiosity. I want to develop my self-awareness. How do you do it? Right? So share best practices, learn from each other. Excellent. So a lot of strengths in curiosity and self-awareness. Now, which one do you want to work on? So of these five, which ones, pick one. I don't want you to do a laundry list, just pick one. Which one do you want to work on? Like, you know what, this is the one I want to work on. Uh, excellent. Stephanie, I have a great, remind me when I get to the resources, I have a great book for you to read on that. So remind me um, when I get to that. I think I have it listed, but a great one. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. And, we sh and I have some resources to share with that. But that's the first step is say, here's what I'm good at. Here's what I want to work on. And then share it with people. And the reason why I ask you to share is because network, talk to people. Um, you know, someone has a strength. They could help you build that. And then perhaps you could help them. So it's all about getting to know people and sharing um, best practices and, and just talking about it. Excellent. Thank you. And I've been using this slide and uh, for years. And I originally got this from Stephen Covey. And I um, shame on me for not having his uh, the, the source on there. So it's Stephen Covey, senior. He wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you, uh, if you, there's a new book. His, so he since passed away and his son took it over. So Stephen Covey Jr. Uh, took the business over and he wrote a book a few years ago called The Speed of Trust. And so what he did is he took all his father's work and put it into today's environment. Now this was like seven years ago. It'd be really interesting and I haven't done this to read the book The Speed of Trust to see how it applies in today's environment. Um, it would be really curious. But he wrote it from with technology and, and the way that we're communicating. But the whole thing is as we go through our life, it's to really focus on what can we control and what can we influence and to let go of the things that, that are things of concern, but we can't control or influence. So let's have a little fun with this. What are things that you could control on a day-to-day -day basis? So in the chat box, send it to all participants. What are those things that you could control on a day-to-day -day basis? What are those things that you could control on a day-to-day -day basis? In the chat box, send it to all participants. What can you control? Uh, excellent, yes. Uh, your schedule, what you eat, your actions, exactly. When you wake up, um, when you go to bed, your living conditions, to the point of like, if you have a clean room, do you not have a clean room, right? Um, and then, you know, are you going to get up to go to work? Are you going to work when you get to work? Or are you going to get distracted with Facebook, right? So you have control of that. Can you control your family members? Yes or no? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that was a trick question. No, yeah, I like it. No way. Yes. Um, but we could influence them, right? So we can't control our family members. We can't control our peers. We can't control our boss, but we can influence them. And that's things that we could do to help influence people. And then what are those things that we're concerned about, but we can't do anything about it? What are those things that we're concerned about that we can't do anything about? Things that we're concerned about, but we can't do anything about in the chat box. Uh, yes. So anything like with, with this virus, right, the whole pandemic, we can't predict when we're going to be able to, you know, really be full at, back in place, you know, in, it, working in with everybody, uh, not having to do Zoom meetings, you know, sending kids to school. You know, we, we don't know the economy, uh, the weather. Those are things that we're concerned about, but we can't control. We can only do our part of it. And a lot of times, so if you have people that have that, um, if you ever don't ever don't say their names, I don't want to know who they are. But do you know people that they spend their whole day walking around going, it's too hot, it's too cold. Why are they doing that? That's never going to work. This isn't right. This isn't fair. We should be able to do this. And they just whine and whine about everything that's like out of their control. And, and one day, a couple times throughout my career, I've actually caught myself where I was that person. Like I was walking around the office complaining about some policy or some new thing that the organization wanted to do. And I looked in the mirror and went, oh my gosh, I'm that person. I'm in that circle of concern complaining about everything. And I had to ask myself, and I actually had a peer one time, 
hold the mirror up to me and say, Janice, what are you going to do about it? What can you control? What can you influence? And I was so glad she said that to me. All she had to do was say, what are you going to do about it? Because it forced me to stop and say, what can I do about it? What can I control? What can I influence? And, and in, in this situation, I ended up leaving the position because the job role had changed. It was something I no longer was interested in and didn't want to do. And so I had to make the decision to leave the position. But it's always, what can you control? What can you influence? And so when it comes looking for a job, what can you control and influence? So when you're trying to get yourself in, in a new position, uh, get back into the workplace, uh, grow your career, what can you control and influence when it comes to job hunting? In the chat box, send it to all participants. What can you control and influence? That's your effort. Yes, are you putting the effort out there? Are you, you know, making, you know, setting a goal? Every day I want to network with so many people. Uh, where you apply? How often? Do you do the follow-up? Um, how are you showing up when you make the phone call, when you send the email? Yes, so your behaviors, exactly. What else? I'm waiting for someone to share this. When it comes to looking for work, what's probably one of the number one things you want to make sure you're doing on a regular basis? You're doing it today, tonight. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jordan. It's that networking. Yes, it's networking, networking, networking. You know, you're reaching out to people. Are you, you know, having those virtual cups of coffee? Are you having a quick 15-minute meeting? Are you talking to people? The networking, and then and it's focusing on what you can control and influence and having those conversations. Yes. So let's get into the science of the brain. Uh, uh, the emotional intelligence is such an interesting thing, and I'll talk more about it, but it, it's, it's the science of the brain. So a lot of people think emotional intelligence is all about emotions. No, it's about the brain, and it's about how our brain and body is all connected and how our brain could actually hijack. So the primitive part of the brain, the danger, danger, you know, this is a bad situation part of our brain, could actually hijack the thinking part of our brain, and it could cause us to have that negative self-talk, as someone mentioned. And our emotions guide our decisions. So if you're in the Chicagoland area, today was cold, it was cloudy, it was drizzly, I woke up and saw snow on the roof. And so a lot of people might have been feeling like, oh, it's cold, I don't want to go outside. But that actually, your emotions are contagious and actually can impact how you show up. And what research is showing is that your emotional intelligence is much more important than your intellectual intelligence. So it's not about, especially in today's workplace, we're constantly networking with people. We're constantly having to communicate with people. So we have to be a subject matter expert in our in, in our job role, as far as like, you know, if we're an accountant, if we're a nurse, right, all the different th the things that we do, but it's really how are we at working with people, working on a team, influencing other people, and that's all about emotional intelligence, and that's what's so important. So here's the science, uh, and I encourage you, if you're one of those folks that love science, just Google, uh, and I'll share some more resources, but just, just do a search on anything about the science of the brain. But what's so interesting is that uh, science is showing that, that there's three parts of our brain. We have the reptilian or the, the amygdala, that's the primitive part of the brain, that's the oldest part of the brain. That's the part of the brain that's constantly scanning the horizon for danger. So if you're a parent, uh, my parents, you're the ones that, you know, your child goes to do something and you quickly respond and grab the child before they touch the hot stove. Or in my case, my mom would, when she slammed on the brakes, we didn't have seatbelts back then, so their arm would come out and stop us. And she didn't even know what she did, right? Parents instinctively respond. That's the, that's the amygdala part of the brain, sensing danger and quickly responding. The limbic part of the brain, that's the emotional feeling part of the brain. That's, so what happens is your brain picks something up, something's not right. And it quickly assigns an emotion to it and says, this is dangerous, I should be afraid, um, I should be happy. And then many times we respond, our behaviors show up from the emotional part of our brain because it takes six seconds to get into the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of our brain. And the thinking part of the brain is the one that's going to have us talk, like that self-talk. So when you start feeling that, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to bomb this interview, I'm not going to do really good, that's the emotional part of your brain talking. But if you pause and think about it, you're like, I got this. I researched the company. I, I know what skills I have that, that matches the job role. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do well. So that's that prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of your brain. So here's an interesting fact, is that the thinking part of your brain, so um, if you 
how many of you raise your hand if you own a child i say own a child because i rent my child so raise your hand if you own a child do you have the opportunity to raise your hand if you own a child i rent mine so i love them but kids are a lot of work um only one one person so for those of you that know people that have kids the prefrontal cortex the thinking part of the brain doesn't fully develop for a girl until she's in her late teens. So for girls, their, their prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of the brain, fully develops when they're in late teens. For boys, it does not fully develop until they're in their mid-20s. So that's why if you have a teenage son and they do something like with their buddies, like let's jump off the roof with our bicycle onto the trampoline and try and make it into the pool, and then they break their arm, and you're like, what were you thinking? They're like, I wasn't, because they weren't. They're not, they, their prefrontal cortex isn't kicked in. And then um, I, I'll never forget when I was in high school, they lined all, at the, I don't know what they did this, so senior year in high school, they had all the girls line up on one side of the gym and the boys line up on the other side of the gym. And I looked at the girls and we were all young women, right? And, and we were thinking rationally, we were making good decisions. And I looked at my peers, the, the, the boys, and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're boys. They weren't young men because they were, you know, doing things that just didn't make any sense because their prefrontal cortex isn't kicking in. So if you have any teenagers, always get them to stop and say, hey, what would mom and dad do? So get them to stop and say, what would mom and dad do? Give them that six seconds to get into their thinking part of their brain. So what's interesting though, is a lot of times we're on autopilot because we're so busy, we got so much going on, we got the demands of the family, we got the demands of work, we're trying to you know, call people, network with people, do all these things, all these chores, that it's getting pulled in so many different directions that we're operating on autopilot. And autopilot is that emotional part of our brain. That's why it's so important to really stop and learn to be fully present. It's like, what's going on right now? What, what needs my attention right now? And, and it's developing that mindfulness. A mindfulness. And also when you have that, that dangers, that, that uh, a stressor pops up, you get angry, uh, you know, something happens, that reptilian part of the brain kicks in, it releases the cortisol and, and the stress hormone, it could take 15 to 20 minutes to recover from that. And if you think about it, if you ever get frightened or you know, like a near miss with the, like someone you know, runs a stop sign and you slam on your brakes. Think about it, your heart rate goes up, your body responds, and it takes 15 to 20 minutes for your body to get back to normal. That's why it's so important for us to really understand how am I showing up, what's going on, and what can I do to help control my emotions? Um, and when we're in that um, um, autopilot, something happens, you know, the boss says something to us, uh, and we think that they snapped at us. Oh my gosh, they snapped at us. And then we quickly, oh, they snapped us because they're mad at me. And we assign an emotion to it. We assign a story versus stepping back and say, what, what's really going on, right? Or even asking them. Uh, it's, it's like, what are the facts really saying versus assigning the emotions to it? So this is emotional intelligence. These are the four quadrants. Daniel Goleman's one of the, my favorite researches that I look that I look at, but you could, you know, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, Travis Bradbury, there's a lot of uh, information out there, emotional intelligence, but I like this because it's the four, four quadrants, very easy to understand. Um, so the first two quadrants, the self-awareness, the self-awareness, self-management is all about how are you showing up? So how are you showing up to a job interview? How are you showing up to, to folks? How are you showing up online? And it's really a deep understanding of your skill set. Do you know what your strengths are? Do you know what your opportunities are? Do you know what your ambitions are? Like, do you really know um, what you want to do? Like, what's that job role that you're trying to you're trying to search for? And do you really have an understanding of um, your capabilities and that, that self-assessment and that, and that mindfulness is being fully present in the moment? And that self-management, that's that being able to change when and as needed. So for instance, if you catch yourself talking too fast, are you able to slow yourself down? Um, are you able to turn where you're asking questions versus, versus making those telling statements? Are you able to reframe reframe your thoughts um, or you know, adapt your language to match uh, the language of the person that, that you're working with, right, uh, that you're interviewing with. So if they use the word coworkers versus employees, are you picking up on that and then using that phrase? And do you have that self-confidence and that self-composure? That's the, you know, so when you hear that self-talk in your head, you're able to put that aside and really focus on the conversation and, and know that I got this. I, you know, I have the skills that I need and here's how it aligns up. So looking at these two, that self-awareness and self-management, so which one do you feel uh, is your strength and which one's your opportunity? So looking at self-awareness and self-management, which one is your strength and which is your opportunity for development? And it could be in different ways. So for example, when it comes to working with clients, 
my self-awareness and my self-management are, are pretty good. When I was in a team setting, so if I had to work on a team, so when I was, you know, a team of individuals, so the, our department, uh, my self-management skills were not the strongest because what I would do is I would get too comfortable and I wouldn't think before I speak. So in a team meeting, I might like blurt something out. So that's, a, that's an opportunity for me in a team setting. So feel free to share as we move on. And the other piece of this then is, it's like I said, to have that, that really, t have that, be honest with yourself, right? Do you really know how you're showing up? And a great way to get honest is to look at any type of assessments that you've had uh, done in the past. So hopefully you've kept anything, anything in previous roles, if you've done DISC, Myers-Briggs, performance appraisals, save all that, pull that out, look to see are there patterns that you see over the years, because if you lay them side by side, you say, you know what, on a regular basis, my performance appraisal would say that I do this. And then the second piece of performance management is um, how am I, how am I showing up to others? Like how can people, am I really picking up how people are, are interacting? So when I'm in that job interview, when I'm, met, when I'm talking to the HR person in, the, in this company, am I really understanding and, see, and, and picking up their perspective, picking up um, how they're feeling about things? And then am I adjusting and, and doing what I can to build the relationship? So it's that relationship management piece of it. Um, so what questions do you have so far about the, the emotional intelligence or the emotional intelligence quadrants? So it's really understanding, like, how am I able to articulate myself in having empathy in the social awareness piece of it, relationship piece, am I able to have the, the dialogue, am I able to influence people, am I able to guide the conversation to where I need it to go? Question, thoughts, reactions to the emotional intelligence uh, quadrants, is there another person or in the book or researcher that you've looked at for emotional intelligence that you found interesting that you want to share in the chat box share it with all participants if there's that if there is any and what is interesting is uh, uh, in Daniel Goldman's book it's called primal leadership he mentions that if you're a leader so you're in a, any type of management role you spend 85% of your time human engineering. So he uses the term human engineering and 15% of the time using your technical skills. So if you think about anyone who ever had to manage people in a leadership role, you're spending the majority of your time helping people, like c convincing them to do something, right? It's like, I need you to do this. I need you to deliver on this product. I need it. It's your, your networking, sharing resources. You're constantly dealing with people. And a lot of us in our roles, if you think about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, customer relations, um, you know, finance, you're probably a lot of time networking with other people, interacting with other people. So it's all about that human experience and, and, the, and the human interaction. But what's nice is emotional intelligence can be developed. So you can develop your emotional intelligence. It's just taking time and it's not difficult. I'll share some tips and tricks for you and how, how can you develop your emotional intelligence, but it's a skill we could all develop. And I say this with love, but we all have that relative out there that we can't take out in public, right? Because you never know what like Aunt Mabel's gonna say to the, you know, to the wait staff at the restaurant or, um, they might use the term a stewardess or you know, those outdated terms. Those are folks where they haven't developed their emotional intelligence. They're not, they don't have that self-awareness. They don't have that self-management. They don't know how like, not to speak or what to say, how to say it. And they're not picking up in the room when people are like, yeah, that probably wasn't the best thing to say. They're just, they're oblivious to it. Um, that's low emotional intelligence, but you can develop your emotional intelligence. So he, what's interesting, and this is from um, Susan, uh, Susan David, and she wrote the book, uh, Emotional Agility, and it's in the resources. I'll share that with you. It's also on the screen. Is that we have six, we say, the research shows that we say 16,000 words a day. So on an average, we say 16,000 words a day. And those are the words that we say. Those are not thoughts. And that we have positive and negative thoughts and emotions on, on a day-to-day -day basis. They're there. What, and so we're not telling you to get rid of them. We're just telling you to accept them. So if you're feeling stressed, you're feeling angry, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling happy, accept it. But if it's an emotion that you don't want, so you're feeling nervous because you're just about to go into a job interview, pause, take a deep breath, give yourself time to get into that prefrontal cortex. Um, and then look at things you know, from a curiosity perspective. Like, oh, it's gonna be interesting to talk to this, these folks. I've been looking forward to hearing more about their organization or looking forward to look, hearing more about what they're looking for in the job role. And they'll use that emotional agility. 
And then label the thoughts and emotions, like how are you feeling? Um, and is it really, uh, sometimes it might be that we think we're angry, but we could just be tired. We could be stressed, right? We could be hungry. What, what's the, right, the phrase that they use when people are stressed out and they're hungry? Is a word that people use. I just learned it a couple of years ago in the chat box, share to all chats. Yes, hangry, thank you, yes. And, and kids demonstrate that really well, right? Like when kids are um, hungry or tired, it shows up as angry, right? They have those, those meltdowns. Adults show it differently. So it's, it's uh, you, know, you know what? I haven't eaten, I haven't, you know, I'm tired. I haven't, you know, I, I should probably just take five, 10 minutes just to regroup. Um, and then also it's developing that emotional agility of acting on your values. And so I encourage if you haven't done this yet to really sit down and say, what's important to me? Uh, what, are, what are my values? So I was talking to Jordan before the workshop started. One of the reasons I left the corporate environment is because I was working way too many hours and I wanted to have more of that work-life balance. I wanted to be able to spend more time with my family and spend more time outside. So I made the decision you know, to walk away from that corporate environment to, to do my own business. Um, so but, was, but I had to really do some searching to say what's important to me and, and what am I going to do and how are we going to make it happen, right? So it's, it's really understanding and talking to the, your loved ones to say what's important to us? What are, the, what are those personal values? Questions, thoughts, or comments about developing your emotional agility with that, what we have at this point. And feel free, there is, so there is no dumb question. Uh, I always tell participants that if you are thinking that question, I guarantee with a group this size, at least two other people have the exact same question. So asking questions is good. That's that why part, right? It's help me understand, tell me more. This workshop's all about you. So what is it that you wanna get out of today? What's gonna help you uh, uh, do what you need to do to help find that, that new job, help secure that role, or develop your emotional intelligence, whatever you want to get out of, out of the workshop today. So here are things you could do to help develop your emotional intelligence. Is really pay attention to your nonverbal interactions. And it's so difficult today because um, we used to be doing, you know, when we were in the office, we're going to actual job interviews where you're sitting there, you know, at a table talking to people, you were able to pick up other people's body languages and they were able to read your body language. And now we just have the computer, we have the camera. That's why it's so important that we use the camera. So I'm gonna throw a little quiz out there for you. You're like, what? I didn't know we were gonna do a quiz. Uh, when we communicate and we watch, uh, we listen and watch for these three things. It's we look for, uh, the words, we listen to the words, oh, hang on a second. We listen to the words that people are using. Um, we also go and uh, watch the nonverbal, so we watch people's tones of voice. And then we, uh, tone of voice, so tone of voice, nonverbal, so nonverbals would be eye contact, hand gestures, things like that, and then the words people use. So what are the percentages? So when we're listening with our senses, how much effort do we put into the words that people are saying? How much uh, do we really put into like the, tone of voice that people are using and how much of the nonverbal skills. This all adds up to 100%. So take those three things, divide it into when we're listening with, to people or paying attention or having a conversation with them, how much of our listening skills go into the listening to their words, the tone of voice, and the nonverbals. So in the chat box, send it to all participants. And let's see, just take a guess. Let's see what you have to say. Ah, we have one vote out there. Others? I'd like to hear from at least one or two other people. Don't let Stephanie be the only one sharing the response. Stacy, one more. Come on. Someone. All right, excellent. So here's the. I'm hats off to all of you because you are like right on. The answer is 7% of what are, are the words. So when people are talking, we're only paying attention to 7% like of the actual words that are using, you, being used. We're putting more into their nonverbal skills, their facial expressions, their eye contact, their hand gestures, their body language. So we're really paying attention to that 
55% and 38% is on the tone of voice. So we're really picking up and we're communicating people with people. We're really watching their nonverbal skills and what, they're, what are they telling us and their tone of voice. And that's why the camera is so important. And uh, it, you know, if you can look at the camera versus looking at the screen, because when you look at the camera, you're making eye contact. I've actually sometimes have put a picture of someone next to my camera. So instead of like zoning out on the light, I have a picture. So it looks like I'm looking at someone. Um, and that's why it's so important to use the, the uh, cameras. And also really when you're uh, in those job interviews, make sure your camera is positioned. So do you have the light? so people could see, um, you're at a distance, so you're not like real close at a distance, so you could uh, pick up. And then I like to use my hands a lot when I talk, so if you notice, I put my hands up closer so that the camera's picking up on that. But I have to be careful because too much hand gestures, could, the camera gets confusing. Now, if I didn't have my camera, so I just had the phone, right, or just, yeah, the, the audio. So we had audio and words only, what do you think the percentage is? So take the camera away, I turn my camera off, how much of my message are you picking up through my tone of voice and my words? Take a guess. Take a guess. And hats off for the folks that put this up, that put your response up there because you were pretty much spot on. But when we're communicating with no camera, what do you think it is? Take a guess. You just have the words and you just have the tone of voice. Ah, yes. So Stephanie knows this. It's, it's 86%, so 86% of your message is on tone of voice, and 14% is, um, is on the words. That's my math, I'm, I'm trying to do my math in the head. Um, but it, the majority of it is a tone of voice. That's why it's so important when you're on the phone with people, stand up while you're talking, because that energy is going to come across through the room. Listen to your tone of voice. Um, are you getting excited? Are you showing people that, oh, I've done this task before, or I just recently, you know, I learned how to develop the skill, and, and I've been, I was able to apply it in this part of my role. So really leverage your tone of voice to communicate, because people are listening for that. They want to hear how that is. And so it's so important to know how are you communicating, but then also, are you paying attention to other folks, right? So if they, their voice gets softer, if they um, all of a sudden stop talking, or they look away, um, or maybe their facial expressions are showing that maybe it looks like they have a question, and you could say, um, you know, does it, do you, is there any, do you have a question? Is there anything else I could share with you, right? So you're reading that body language and you're validating it and you're also, um, uh, you know, asking them and, and having that dialogue. So you're, you're paying attention to their body language. Another way to develop your emotional intelligence is I, I call it ask those loving critics for feedback. So go back to people that know you well beyond your family. So if you're looking for a new job, don't go to your family saying, you know, what skills do I have? You need to go to people that you worked with, people that know what you do for a living, right? So for instance, if I'm asking people for feedback, my, facil my facilitation skills, I'm not gonna go to my boss, I'm gonna, or my peers, I'm gonna go to people that are in my class, because they're gonna be able to give me some good feedback on my facilitation skills. So ask those folks that you know are gonna be honest and give you honest feedback. And instead of just going up to someone, hey, can you give me feedback? You know, what it, you know just, give me feedback, help them, help them by giving them an opportunity. So when I worked with you on this project, what did I do that helped you? What did I do that hindered you? And what do you wish I would have done differently? Right? When, when we sat next to each other in the office for the last five years, what did I do that drove you crazy? What did I do that helped you? And what do you wish I would have done differently? Um, you know, when I was your, you know, your boss, or when I, you know, when I was your accountant, what did I do that helped you? What did I do that hindered you? What do you wish I would do differently? So you're asking those open-ended questions around specific things. So it gives them things that they could um, give you uh, feedback on. And then what's the, what's the number one thing you should do when you ask people for feedback? So you go to someone saying, hey, can you give me some feedback? I wanna know when I worked with you on this project, you know, what did I do that really helped you? What did I do that hindered you? What did I do that? What do you wish I would do differently? What do you need to make sure you do? A couple things in the chat box and it's all participants. What do you need to do when you ask someone for feedback? Yes, say thank you and listen, listen, listen. Yes, say thank you and listen. Don't try and make excuses, don't alibi, but you could ask for an example. You know, can you give me an example? So you, know, you could ask for an example, but it's treat it as a gift, thank them and listen. And if you're ever giving feedback to anyone, 
always, always, always focus on what's the specific behavior? What did they do? Um, and and be, be prepared to share an, an example. Because when I teach performance management, I teach people how to, how to give performance appraisals um, or how to receive a performance appraisal. I always tell people, if your boss ever says to you, you did a great job, you should say, thank you. Can you give me an example? Right, because great job tells you nothing. Like people will, in, in the training world, when we used to do those eva those paper evaluations at the end of class, we say, hey, take this evaluation. And we'd get, you know, we call them smiley, smile sheets. Because what would happen, people say, oh, great job. And they pull a smiley face. That tells me nothing, right? Do you like my hair? Like, what was it that you like? So when you're giving feedback, always be very specific. What was it, what was the specific behavior that the person did that added value or the specific behavior to do differently? Um, pay attention, know how you, how you show up. What are your physical reactions, right? So um, for instance, when I would get, uh, when we could get sudden change, like I'm good with change if I know change is coming, but when the boss would say, okay, as of tomorrow, we're now doing this, I would like freak out and I would there again, blurt things out. I wouldn't think before I speak. So I would always have to know my physical, like, A, don't say anything, Janice. And also my facial expressions, because I would be the one that would make those weird faces in team meetings. So you need to know that, right? And I would have peers that would coach me. Like they would just look at me and give, and give me an eye and I would know that, okay, that face is starting to pop up. So I would know how I need to, to um, respond. And then listen, ask questions, challenge assumptions, right? Can you tell me more? Can you give me some examples? And then reflect, start looking for patterns. Like I said, pull out those assessments that you've done in other, you know, other parts of your job, pull out those performance appraisals that you've had over the years and lay them side by side. And are there any type of patterns that are showing up? And then you can even go to people and say, you know, this popped up in my last three performance appraisals. Am I still doing that? Do you still see that? And ask for that feedback. Questions, thoughts, or comments on this? And like I said, it's getting into that, that learning loop. And what's interesting is the higher you get up into an organization, the less candid feedback you get because people are like afraid to give the boss feedback. So it's, it, that's why you wanna learn how to give and receive feedback because feedback is so important. And that's where the emotional intelligence comes in because if you're in that, that social awareness, you could get feedback just by watching people. Like how are they responding? Like when you walk into the room, when you say something, how do people respond? Do they cringe? Do they, they shut down? Um, I was coaching someone one time to where every time his, he would walk down the hall, his team members would scatter, right? They'd see him coming and they'd all go in 25 different directions uh, and they didn't really want to do anything for him. And so my coaching to him at the time was, because he would like go down the hall and he'd just start barking out orders, do this, do that, do this. And he, and he would like tell people what to do. So my coaching was for the next week, just start every conversation with, can you do me a favor? He's like, I'm not gonna do that. Why should I do that? They should like to be working here, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, just start every conversation when you, when you walk into the office and you're going down the hall and you see someone, instead of telling them what to do, start with, can you do me a favor? And then tell them what to do. He resisted, but he finally said, okay, I'll try it for a week. So he tried it for a week and he came back. He's like, oh my gosh. He's like, people actually, when they saw me coming, would come and say, what do you need? And so people were responded much more positive with just saying, hey, can you do me a favor? And then he told them what to do. So that's that, like, how are you showing up? Are you telling people what to do versus asking questions? Um, are you coming on forceful? Are you not coming on forceful enough? Like, are you not standing up for what you believe in or, or sharing your thoughts and ideas when you should share your thoughts and ideas? So it's that self-reflection, really knowing how you, how you show up. And then it's that being open-minded, being curious. We've talked about that before. Watch those non, those about non-verbal interactions. Start really start watching people. And uh, there's so much you could pick up uh, when you're watching on the camera. It's it's if you could uh, when you are able to go like in public or the grocery store, you know, watch people that way, and you're able to pick things up. It's it's so difficult with the masks because we can't see people's. Uh, you know, we can't see their facial expressions. We're just getting from the eye, the eyes up. So that's difficult. Um, ask people for feedback and pay attention. So looking at all of these that are on the list, which one do you want to work on? So it's like, you know what? I think I'm going to start focusing on this. Which one do you want to work on? I'd like to hear from at least half the participants is of these five on the list, which one do you want to fo start focusing on for the next week? So for the next week, you're just gonna, almost like out-of-body experience, we're just gonna observe yourself. Which one? 
Uh, excellent. Thank you, Nathan. So it's really, really watch my those nonverbal interactions. Yes. And like, and like, there's people that have poker faces where like you never know how they're feeling because you can't see their emotions. Well, that could be good or bad, right? If because some or there's people that look like they're angry all the time, and so people think they're mad at them when they're just thinking, right? So you want to know how you're showing up. So how do you show up? Excellent. So that being open-minded, curious, listening, asking those open-ended questions, asking for feedback. Yes, and now is a great time, right? Especially if you you're not working with that person anymore. You know, go back to people that you worked with two years ago, three years ago, right? And say, hey, help me. I, you know, can you, you know, can you, can you do me a favor? Who's going to say no when you say, can you do me a favor, right? Or, I, um, you know, I just need to spend 15 minutes with you. Can you do me a favor? I'm just asking, you know, just asking, what, what did I do that really helped you? What did I do that handed you? And what do you wish I would have done differently? And most people would be willing to do that. So here are the resources that I wanted to share with you. And yes, and so um, the person that said uh, the, the, the voice and the, the self-talk, the book Taming Your Gremlin by Richard Carlson. So uh, Richard Carlson wrote the book Taming Your Gremlin. It's an old book. It's been written for years. And you could read it in like two and a half hours. But it's a great book because it gets it helps teach you when you get that voice in your head going, I'm never going to do well, I'm going to bomb, uh, you know, the son of you, I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have applied for the job. When you start hearing that voice, it, the uh, taming your gremlin helps you get out of that. Uh, and then anything from Dan Pink is good. And then um, any, and then I have the emotional intelligence, Susan David, uh, Richard David's an, an, another favorite of my TED Talks. There's some great TED Talks out there. Um, so you just go ahead and go to TED Talk. There's actually, if you go to TED Talk and then do a search for increase your emotional intelligence, five TED Talks, increase your emotional intelligence. There is, there's five TED Talks that they have. Um, Richard Davidson's a, he's a scientist uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he uh, has, it's called the Center for Healthy Minds. And it helps you just get into that mindful moment. So first I want to recognize this chat. Um, I love it. So someone is confessing that there's six children. See, children are so good at influencing us. They, because if you think about it, children watch people like a hawk. And children are so good at picking up really quickly that if I do this or say this to mommy, I'll get what I want. And if I do this or say this to daddy, I get what I want. Or from grandma, kids are so good at influencing because they pick up on the body language and they know how to just look at and turn their face. And then they say, can you do me a favor? Who's going to say no to a six-year-old? So excellent example. Thank you. Um, how many of you do any type of mindfulness, meditation? Raise your hand or uh, put your favorite app in the chat box if you do anything around meditation or mindfulness. Anyone? And I'm sure the library has a ton of resources on uh, mindfulness and meditation as well. So research shows you could actually rewire your brain and John Cabot's uh, um, Richard Davidson has research that actually shows us. It's a book called The Emotional Styles of Your Brain. And you could actually rewire your brain. So I used to say, oh, I'm not good with numbers. I'm not good with numbers. Well, what I found out is that like the, the part of my brain that does the analytical part, the number part, yeah, it might not be real strong, but if I did a certain type of uh, my, uh, meditation or if I did some certain type of mental exercises, I could actually develop that part of my brain where I could get better at the analytical part. I'll never, you know, be a genius like the, you know, CFOs and the people that, that are crunching numbers and doing uh, the scientists, but I could, I can get better. A great example is people that have strokes and they lose the ability to write. Well, they learn how to write with their non-dominant hand. They're actually rewiring their brain or they uh, lose the ability to speak. But then they, through therapy, they develop the skill and they're able to speak again. What they're doing is they're rewiring the brain. And meditation um, actually helps you rewire the brain. So if you have that negative self-talk or you're trying to um, you, you get into that fixed mindset, you can actually teach yourself to get out of that. Um, and that's what anything that you see on those websites. Uh, so, and, and the library has a ton of resources. So Jordan, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if there's anything that you want to highlight that the library has, I love the online. First, I want to shout out to the libraries. Libraries are like phenomenal resources that I think so few people take advantage of because we not only have this, these beautiful buildings that have all these cool books and other things in them, um, and then there's so many cool things you could check out. You also now have all these resources online that you could tap into. Um, so you don't even have to 
go to library. So Jordan, anything you want to highlight from the library perspective on resources? Sure. I mean, besides these career webinars, you know, we offer webinars related to business and technology and even more. You could check out our events calendar online. Um, besides the webinar, we know we offer one-on-one um, -on -one assistance to, you know, these days because of the current situation, we're meeting a lot of people via Zoom, but we still try our best to give you that one-on-one uh, -on -one experience where you could see us and you can hear us. Um, we're, we're helping people with resume reviews, practice nice. interviews, starting a business, um, maintaining your business. And then um, as Janice mentioned, we have really great library resources that can help you uh, with those same topic, topics, resume reviews, uh, public speaking courses. I've certainly taken those myself and just overall professional development tools. Um, and I'll have my contact information here in just a moment. So if you want even more information, I'd be happy to share. Excellent. And then do you do anything like uh, online yoga or meditation? Oh, or... yes. <laughs> Check oh, it. I mean, we have crafty adults. So if you want some fun, we have writer's workshops. We have all types of things coming up. So yeah, it'd be best, I think, to check out our events calendar. And not just for adults, for children, families, and their teens and teens as well. Excellent. Yes. And anything like, for instance, um, like reading, like, you know, where they read to kids or yoga, meditation, that's all going to help you get into that mindfulness and be fully present. So you're like, well, how's that going to help with the job search? It's going to help because it's going to help center you. It's going to help you get to know yourself and, and developing, uh, you know, doing the, art, the adult's craft is developing that creative side. It's getting you outside of your comfort zone, doing something completely different. And it might spur an idea or a new skill set that you never even had, that you knew you had. So that's a great opportunity to try that. Excellent. So the big question to ask yourself is, would you hire you? So when you're looking at that job that, and you're looking at the job description and you're looking at your skill sets and you're looking at how you show up, would you hire you? And first you need to answer that question. And then you need to ask, well, why? Why would you, you know, is it not? If it's not, no, I wouldn't hire me. Well, why not? What do you need to change? And if it's yes, why? You know, why would we want to hire you? What are those skills that you bring to the table? So how can you add value? And so that gets into that, um, you know, we might like for, you know, as we get older, we have, we get more and more experience. Um, and so someone mentioned age, ageism is trying to find a job, but think about it from a, the work ethic. Think about from the experiences, the knowledge, things that you've seen. Those are all wonderful things um, and, and things that you've had to weather, right? Like economy crashes, downsizing, uh, technology. I mean, I remember when technology, you know, computers came into the workforce, right? So I've, I had to live through all that of going from typewriters to computers to, you know, I, you know, I remember those days. And those are all skill sets of learning to be resilient, learning to be agile. And so it's, it's letting people know that, hey, this is, this is something that comes easy to me, change, because I've had to go through a lot of different changes. Oh, going the wrong direction. And then finally, is understand you hold the key to your success. You know, focus on what you could control and influence. What is it that you could control and influence? What are those things that, that are within your control? And then make a plan and keep getting yourself out of your comfort zone. So that call of action is what are you gonna do differently? We spent 55 minutes together. What is it you're going to do differently? Now that you took this time, congratulations to, you know, in the evening, you fed your family after dinner. Some of you are probably waiting to have dinner. Um, now that you, we've spent 55 minutes, what are you going to do differently? What's that call to action? What are you going to do to take charge of your development and, your, and to develop your emotional intelligence? And at the same time, I'd like to, so I'd like to hear from everybody, but then also, if, what questions do you have? So what questions do you have? So what are you going to do differently and what questions do you have? And I encourage questions. Thoughts, responses. You could either take your phone off mute, I believe, or we could go in the chat box. What was that aha moment for you for tonight? Excellent. And a great um, to really center yourself is just throughout the day, just pause and take a breath. Just pause and focus on your breathing. Just focus on taking one or two deep breaths. Um, a great story, I had a, my uh, little nephew, he was like th three years old and he's having a meltdown. And I would just, I just grabbed him and got him real close in a loving hug grab. And I just said, let's breathe. And we just breathed like three or four times, just took like three or four deep breaths and he calmed down. 
like three like three weeks later they had a golden retriever puppy we all you know golden retrievers are like hyper dogs and the golden retriever was like going crazy so i grabbed the golden retriever by the you know by his jaws by his head and i got real close to him and i just breathed i just took like 10 deep breaths and you know the dog calmed down it actually worked so that deep breathing actually helps center yourself and helps calm you down others access to that more of my time try and, and, and try and inspire other people so it's like take what you learned today and talk to other folks it's all about that continuous learning, continuous growth. So talk to people. So Jordan's going to send out um, a handout that we have. It will have those resources on there. I encourage you to continue the conversations. And thank you for taking the time. And Jordan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Janice. That was wonderful. So here is my contact information. Um, if you want to reach out to me or if you have any further questions, um, for Janice. And like I said, we have a lot more webinars coming up, um, not just our career webinars, but our business series, our uh, technology series here. And I'll be sure to send out um, more information afterwards. And we have a and, great question on the board. Oh, go ahead, of, go ahead. So what's a good prompt or reminder to, um, of the control influence circle to put us back into that, you know, being fully present of what I could control and influence. So my, it would be like, when do you get triggered, right? So is it that you need a visual? So maybe take and print and put a visual somewhere or pictures somewhere in your office or like a bracelet. So, you know, I, for a while, there was a special bracelet that I wore because I had to work with someone that was difficult to work with. So every time I had a meeting with that person, I wore that bracelet. So every time I was in the meeting with that person, I would have my hand on the bracelet and it just kept me grounded of, you know, not to get angry, not to blurt things out. So find out what you could do to help. Excellent. Good question. That's an excellent question. Thank That's you. Great. Others? All right. Oh, someone. Yeah, the bracelet has also worked for them. Ah, see? Oh, it looks like somebody might have a question here. And yeah, I could stay on, so I'm sure. fine. Sure. Great. I don't, I don't have any meetings. All right. We'll, <laughs> we'll let her talk. Um, all right, Carolyn, you, you should be able to speak if you'd like. Carolyn, did you have a question? You might have to unmute yourself, so. Oops, I yes. lost it. There oh. you are. There Yay. you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah, so what I said is, um, that, yeah, I didn't really have a question, but a comment that for me, when I'm having a hard time working through my emotions, if I journal about it, I often get somewhere, yeah. whereas if I try and think about it, it gets circular. I don't journal at work, but I can take a break and yes. maybe do a little mini journal or something. Uh, yes. That really helps me a lot. Excellent. That's an excellent thing to share. Thank you for bringing that up. Journaling is, there's so much research that shows that journaling is such a wonderful exercise. And, and to your point, it could just be five minutes a day, just write things down. So yes, journaling is like great. And there's the actual books you could buy that will like give you things to think about that you journal in. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Glad you brought that up. Others. And I know the library has resources on journaling. So if you just go to yep. their website and type in journaling, I'm sure there's authors that have all that stuff. So my morning routine, thank you. So um, I find I have a hard time transitioning from summer to fall and then from spring to winter. So I, my routine always gets messed up. But um, uh, so last year I had, a, I had a journey with cancer. So I had to deal with uh, ovarian cancer. So I had to go through a whole different journey and talk about life changing, right? And resiliency and learning how to deal with all that. So my routine now is I get up and I do uh, meditate. So I spend at least 10 minutes, if not 20 minutes a day meditating in the morning. Um, I have an app called Calm that's free. I, I'm in all the free apps, so Calm's a good free app. And then um, I also do yoga because I'm, I'm at the age where I'm realizing that we have to warm our bodies up every morning. So in the morning, and I love, we, I have a resource to online yoga. Uh, it's through our, my local library and uh, great instructors. And so I just will just there again, if I don't, don't have time to go to the class, I do at least 15 minutes of yoga in the morning just to stretch and wake up my body because it just helps me get better. 
But the thing is find the routine that works best for you. Is it doing yoga at night? Is it journaling? Is it, you know, meditating throughout the day? Like find what works best for you. So excellent. Thank you for asking. And if you'd like, I could put a little plug. If you want to learn more about my cancer journey, uh, if you go to YouTube, and type in my business name, All About You. So A-U-L-L -L and the word about and the letter U, All About You. Um, I made a videos. I did a, so I did a, a video journal. So I did a, they call it vlog, a vlog um, once a week uh, last year. To, so I could keep people up to date on my, my cancer journey. So, and that, when I first started, it was more a way to keep people up to date. But it turned out to uh, Carolyn's point, it actually turned out to be my therapy of doing my videos because it helped me work through the challenges I was working through. So. Carolyn, thanks for bringing up the journaling. All right, other All questions? Right. Think of any more questions. I just wanted to mention just one more thing. Uh, we will not have a career webinar next week. We're taking a little bit of a, a quick one break break for November 3rd, uh, but we'll continue again on November 10th. But please, by all means, if you have any further questions, or if you would rather speak. Once again, Janice, thank you so much. That was awesome. great. Thank you. Wait, let's put Jordan on the spot. That was great because, given <laughs> one behavior, Jordan, I'm going to put you on the spot. What, what, why do you think this webinar added value? Um, you know, I'm always moving forward very fast and I always need a reminder to pause all the time. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for playing along with the, <laughs> with the giving feedback. You're welcome. Okay, everyone. Well, if we don't have any further questions, I think I will go ahead and uh, end the webinar. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care.